Good morning, everyone. My name is John D'Antona, and I'm the Director of Marketing here at CAPUS. Welcome to our virtual bank trust panel discussing trading in low price stocks. Before we begin, let me take a minute to thank all our panelists and attendees for joining us today. On behalf of the CAPUS family, we'd like to sincerely thank you all for participating in this event. There will be a question and answer session at the conclusion of this panel. We invite all to simply type their questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom, and we'll be sure to do our best to get them answered in the method they received. Also, on behalf of compliance, let me get our legal manners and legalese out of the way. The opinions expressed by the featured speakers are neither those of Capital Institutional Services nor its employees. Any comments and or information presented within this presentation are for the sole use of institutional investors. Nothing in this presentation should be construed as an offer, invitation, or recommendation to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any securities that might be mentioned. And now on with the panel. Let me turn it over to our moderator, John Lance. John? Thanks, John. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with introductions. Uh, my name is John Lance. I'm the Senior Vice President and Director of Bank and Trust Services here at Capus. Um, I've been with Capus for the last 15 years um, and also have prior experience as a trust officer uh, with Bank of America. Um, Jason Christian is our Chief Compliance Officer and General Legal Counsel here at Capus. Uh, Jason has been with us for the last nine years. Um, and prior to Capus, Jason worked in private practice representing both investors and financial institutions in securities arbitration and civil suits. Um, Michael Aguilera is a first vice president and equity trader uh, here at Capus. He's been with us for the last eight years. And prior to Capus, he has experience as a financial rep for Fidelity. Um, Steve McCabe uh, is a VP and senior product manager at Fifth Third Bank. Um, Steve is on the custody side of the bank and has been with Fifth Third for a total of 18 years with a five-year stint at JP Morgan in the middle, um, kind of closer to the beginning of 2000. Um, but Steve has over 35 years in financial services. Um, and then we have Bill Stone. Um, he is a chief investment officer of Glenview Trust. Uh, prior to Glenview, uh, Bill gained experience as a chief investment officer of Avalon Advisors. He's the, uh, he was the Global Chief Investment Strategist at PNC Asset Management Group. And before that, he was the Chief Investment Officer at First Western Trust. Um, so as everybody knows, uh, the topic of today's um, roundtable is uh, trading in low price stocks. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and dive right in. And I figured we would start with uh, Jason, um, he, since he's our uh, Chief Legal Counsel and Compliance Officer. Um, Jason, would you mind giving us kind of a a brief definition of what low price stocks are for our purposes today. Sure. Thank you, John. Um, honestly, there's a couple definitions, right? There's the black letter definition that you'll see from the SEC that typically includes any stocks that are trading under $5 a share. Um, but, but from a practical standpoint, I think, and for the purposes of this discussion, I think we need a little bit deeper definition, um, which can sometimes be a little bit nebulous, right? You've got, um, Yes, stocks under, you know, st the price is important, the stocks under $5, but I think the lower the price of the stock, the more they become on the radar of, of the uh, interested parties being the regulators. Um, so you, you look at things like, if it, you know, obviously under a dollar's um, a little bit more on their radar. And if you get, you know, under, let's say a penny, then that's significantly more um, garners attention from the regulators. And so you, you have price, but you also have, um, the market cap of the uh, of the issuer itself, so micro cap securities, those trading under let's say 250 million uh, market cap, or um, or even the uh, exchange where the um, or, the or the lack of an exchange. So typically um, over the counter securities, those trading um, on the pink sheets, the gray markets, things like that. Um, those are the ones that we really talk about when we're talking about um, penny stock or low price stock regulations. Great and. Um... You know, what are some of the specific regulatory rules or guidelines when it comes to low price stocks? It might depend a lot on who who's being regulated. Um, you know, I know that we have um, and clients and investors and institutional investors on the call, and on bank trusts. Um, 
from, from our standpoint as a broker dealer, we have regulations under um, the Securities and Exchange Act, Rule 10B, um, Rule 10B-5. We have uh, certain, those are related to fraudulent um, activities in stock markets. Um, we're, we're also regulated by FINRA and there's some specific FINRA related rules. But really where they all sort of stem from is the Bank Secrecy Act, right? And FinCEN who regulates under the Bank Secrecy Act. And, and, and essentially, um, what the obligation under, under FinCEN is, is for, for, for any financial institution, um, not just broker dealers, but also banks and other, other institutions to report suspicious activity that uh, might signify money laundering, tax evasion, or other criminal activities. And um, the BSA and the FinCEN has been on the record repeatedly stating that um, suspicious low-priced or penny stock activity would squarely fall within those AML uh, money laundering concerns. Gotcha. Um, so Steve, I'm going to shift it over to the custody side since you work kind of on the custody side. Uh, what's the custodian's role in managing risks associated with the low price stocks? Yeah, thanks, John. So as you can imagine, as the, as the custodian of the funds, we're kind of on the backside in the detection and monitoring uh, side. And since we're holding the DTCC participant ID, we interact a lot with the depositories too because they have pretty robust detection programs in place uh, to detect these types of activities. So we get a lot of inquiries from external sources, whether it be from a broker dealer or a client um, or a regulator or the depository. And we're in a role of responding to that and doing a little investigation work on the backside. Great. So does Fifth Third Bank have like an internal monitoring, pro monitoring process in place uh, to kind of help identify the um, low price stock risks within client accounts? And if, if you all do, uh, what does that look like? Yeah, so it's a pretty extensive program, as you can imagine, being a national bank. Our, our main role, as I said, is detection and monitoring. But as part of our risk programs, we're, we're required to have those programs in place to help catch those items. So we have an entire unit within our risk and compliance area that's called our financial crimes unit that really houses an internally developed matrix of risk items that they're looking for, not only across the security side, but the regular banking transactions as well. So they will gather feeds from all the different uh, systems within the bank core. And in our case, it's the trust platform that feeds all the securities and positions and over. And they're looking for odd patterns. They're looking for anomalies. If somebody happens to be uh, running through a large volume of securities that haven't been held before, and then they'll open up an investigation on their end and come back to us on the business owner side to start asking questions about that underlying client and activity. So it's it's uh, pretty extensive and we're responsible for detecting a lot of that activity. Gotcha. Um, Michael, from a trading perspective, um, say uh, a client does have a low price stock in their portfolio and they want to liquidate, right? Um, and, and they come to, to our trading desk. Um, what are some of the hurdles that, that you kind of run into in, in even executing these trades? You know, as a trader, it's our job to source liquidity, uh, mitigate market risk, and get best X for our clients. Uh, these low price stocks have really, really made that difficult in the sense that the liquidity profiles and these names can change drastically on a daily basis. You know, for example, it's, it's not uncommon to see these things trade 25, 50 million, even 100 million shares a day. Well, clients can take a position of, you know, 10 million shares, no problem with liquidity like that. The issue we run into is, you know, when the buzz around these names, when the hype around these names really, really dissipates, uh, you really see liquidity start to fall off. You know, these names might go from trading 50 million shares a day to a million to 5 million. Well, then you have a client who has a position of 10 million shares and they want to liquidate it. Well, at that point, you know, you're 200% of the ADV at that point, if it's only trading 5 million shares a day. So we really run into issues because we can't trade these using an algo. 
per se, we can say, okay, we'll work this in a VWAP algo for you and put a cap of 20% volume. Algos don't accept these low price OTC names. So we're stuck manually doing these orders on a daily basis. So we're constantly looking at the bid and ask, seeing, okay, is the bid building up? Can I hit the bid here? Uh, so it becomes very cumbersome and very time consuming. And also when you see liquidity dry up like that, um, you also run into market risk because you can see spreads really widen. And as spreads widen and liquidity is gone, you can really move these names around quite a bit. So you really got to be mindful of how you're trading. You can't just be throwing shares out there and saying, okay, I'll get this done for you today. They're very time consuming, very cumbersome. That's why we've really adopted uh, kind of the industry standard 5% uh, commission rule on these. Uh, typically what we do now is we'll charge, you know, up to 5% uh, of the gross commission or the gross profit. And to be honest, on a lot of these trades, that really just helps us cover our ticket charges. So those are some of the hurdles we run into. Also, you know, we have outside factors that we have to watch out for. I know it was mentioned earlier where, you know, if we're trading millions of shares in a specific name on a daily basis, our custodian, uh, Merrill Lynch, they'll typically come to us and say, hey, we've noticed you've been trading this, you know, quite frequently over the past couple of days. How many more shares do you have to trade? And typically, if we, our answer is, you know, 5 million to 10 million shares, if, it, if it's a significant number, they can shut us off. At that point, we have to go to our client. And unfortunately, we've got to let them know, hey, we're sorry, but we're told by our custodian, they're no longer going to settle this for us. So, you know, we, we can't trade it for you anymore. So it, you know, it, it, it can make things a little difficult on both parties, but those are some of the hurdles that we, that we run into on the desk. Well, I've even noticed where, um, you know, the large trader ID comes into play, right? Like, so um, for instance, if a, if a client um, is not used to trading, uh, you know, millions of shares a day, and all of a sudden they have, you know, 20 million shares of, uh, of a certain security, now they're um, required to, to, you know, get a, a large trader ID uh, or, or apply for a large trader ID where they had never done that before. And so um, I've even seen with some of my clients where we've, we've had to go and ask um, because, of, uh, because of volume um, issues when it comes to this. And, and they were surprised that they even had, had to do that. So, um, so there is that issue as well, I've, I've noticed. Um, so <clears throat> When, when a, a, an order comes in or a client asks you, you know, they, they've got this, this order, um, you know, do, do they normally just send it in um, electronically? Do they call ahead? Um, and, and if so, you know, how do you start off um, to see if we can even trade the security? A lot of times, if it's a significant size, uh, I think our clients have gotten to the point where they un understand that these low price stocks can be an issue. So they'll call ahead of times and they'll say, hey, we've got a client who is trying to bring this specific uh, security in. It's a low price stock. It trades over the counter. Uh, will you guys be able to trade it for us? And one of the tools that we've been given or that we were referred to by our custodian was the OTC Markets website. Um, that website, we can quickly go in and look at the profile of these low price stocks to see if we're going to be able to trade them. Uh, and that we can kind of, we can kind of get, get ahead of any issues at that point. Um, so that's one of the tools, but I think also getting ahead and just having the conversation with the client, letting them know, Hey, look, we understand you want to buy this low price stock or, you know, your client does just understand and just know that at any point, our custodian can come back and say, hey, we're no longer going to settle this specific name. So you might not be able to liquidate this, uh, this specific name. So those are, you know, those are some of the ways that we kind of mitigate any issues before they arise. Um, so, yeah. So when you're looking up a stock in the OTC Markets website, um, what are you specifically looking for? Because I know that that's available to our clients as well. They could obviously look that up too. Um, even ahead of calling you. And so uh, what are the things that you're kind of specifically looking for on that site? Yeah, you know, we have mentioned it to some clients who are getting frequent in trading uh, low price stocks. Uh, we have given them, we have referred them to the website as well. And we tell them, 
four, four main things to look for um, is uh, you'll see some designations of uh, pink uh, limited information or pink no information. That means it's traded in the pink sheets, but it doesn't have the required information to be a verified profile. Uh, also, any gray market securities, uh, those we've been told that, you know, our custodian is no longer going to sell those. Uh, also, if you see a, a stop sign on there next to the ticker, that typically means that they're delinquent in their SEC filings. So uh, BAML is not going to settle those for us. And the biggest one, the main one, is uh, the caveat mTOR designation. That essentially stands for buyer beware. Uh, typically, that one has that, des if it has that designation, it's usually something to dealing with uh, fraud or uh, any kind of suspicious activity. So those are the four main ones to, to look out for. That's great. That's great to know for, for the clients, for sure. Um, Steve, so um, what questions might the custodian uh, or fifth third be asking your clients um, after uh, the identification of a risk associated with um, low price share or low price stock activity? <clears throat> Yeah, and, and as you can imagine, this is where it gets a little uh, tricky in certain cases, as, as you guys have mentioned about having to have conversations with clients. Um, we may be in a position where we will go back to the client, especially if we're holding their position in an omnibus account, which is very typical, especially in the trust department space. We don't know who that underlying client is that's that's conducting that activity. So we will have to have a conversation with our client to kind of dig in to their business, quite honestly, to ask who that client is, what kind of an entity is it, if it's an entity, uh, what's the, the purpose of the transacting that they're doing, much the same as uh, Mike has alluded to, is it something that's gonna continue, is it temporary? And then we kind of have to work with the client to make the determination if it's, you know, a valid business purpose. Um, it can lead to some tough conversations because if the activity can't be controlled, we could be in a position just because of our responsibilities to, to walk away from a relationship, which is something that we never want to do. Um, you know, the other thing that I'll add, I, I know we're talking primarily about trading here, but as a custodian, we have to be careful about clients who are just receiving insecurities on the free side. Uh, that's part of our fraud detection and part of the AML compliance. You see periodically that people will get a hold of these lower price securities because of the, the lax registration statements and so forth, and they'll get a hold of physical securities and want to deposit them into their account so that they can liquidate and obviously get the cash out the backside. So. Those are tough conversations for us to have as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Bill, I want to bring it kind of over to the the our clients' uh, perspective as well. And and you know, from conversations that we've had, um, I know your firm doesn't typically trade in low price stocks, um, but you recently had a client request for assistance in this area. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what happened there? Yeah, and it's another reason to think about this because you know many people probably wouldn't even think this even applied to them because honestly, if I wouldn't have had this happen here, I would have just assumed it did not apply to our firm and I would have just been like, ah, forget it. So what happened is we have a client, longtime client, longtime family client uh, that does consulting. So lo and behold, one day he realizes that he had gotten these multiple companies, but this particular company had gotten stock as part of his compensation for doing some consulting. He thought it was long you know, let's call it dead, um, and that there was never going to be any worth to this equity. So all of a sudden he sees, wow, all of a sudden this thing is trading it, you know, frankly, it was less than a penny, but it was trading. Um, and so he called us up and said, can you help me out with it? We really didn't think twice about it because, you know, it's like everybody, right? Your first answer to your clients is usually, yeah, we're, we're here to help and we want to help you out with this. And so, he deposited the stock. Um, you know, like I said, we didn't really think twice about it until then. We we looked a little bit closer at it because I don't even think we looked necessarily at the pricing and all that. We just said, well, it's a public traded security. We'll deposit it and get it going. Um, then I got involved because we started looking at it, and you know, at less than a penny, 
frankly, it scares the bejesus out of you because it's, you know, the, the bid ass spread is typically wide. Who knows, you know, like Michael was talking about, who knows when the volume disappears. I mean, I'm not a trader, but I know enough to know that kind of stuff is, you know, liquidity is an issue. Um, so thankfully, uh, in this case, Capus was able to help us out and, and actually the client got great execution um, and was happy with what we were able to help him out with. But, you know, that was uh, certainly a wake up call to us. Absolutely. So after that happened, I mean, obviously it doesn't happen often. So um, what kinds of procedures have you guys put in place uh, to mitigate these issues in the future? Yeah, I mean, so one thing is we've always had the procedure of Anytime we're bringing in, let's say, a new relationship, we look at all the securities that we're bringing in. Clearly, we're going to look a little closer at, you know, what they are. Um, we always did, but, you know, kind of reminded everybody, you know, this is kind of, a, I guess, back to a new world again, that you may see more of these kind of things show up and just to be mindful of that type of thing. And then secondarily, if you've got a, I mean, I don't know how often we're going to run into this situation. We just don't. But if somebody is wants to bring in some outside securities that's already a client, we do need to kind of think about that or make sure that that we know what we're doing when we do that. Yeah. And, and I know from my my trust officer days that we, you know, certainly had clients that would, um, you know, had discretion over their accounts to a degree and, and want to, to purchase some of these um, low price stocks. Um, and especially with with uh, COVID and people working from home and having maybe a little bit more time on their hands. Um, I, I know for certain some of my clients um, have, have increased in, in this space as well. Um, Michael, on the trading side, do you, you know, do you see an increased trend of investing in these type of low price stocks? Do you think this is going to continue to rise or, or what's your opinion on that? You know, I, I think it is going to continue to rise, especially with the, you know, the new, new apps coming out like, Robinhood, eToro, it makes it it makes it more readily available for these uh, just your typical retail investor to invest in these penny stocks. You know, I think a lot of people they they might see you know their their neighbor or their friend making you know quite a bit of money on some of these names, and they're like, oh, I want in. So I definitely think that you're going to see this increased trend um, until strong regulatory action is taken in these names. Yeah, I I definitely see you think you're going to see this trend uh, continue. Gotcha. Well, I'm going to bring it back to, to Jason, um, kind of more on the compliance side. Um, what's been your experience um, here at Capus uh, regarding uh, the regulators and, the, and low price stocks? Well, you, you know, thankful, thankfully, we haven't necessarily run into any issues with the regulators related to any low price trading. We did have, um, I had some meetings about a year ago, um, the SEC, this would have been right before the COVID sent us all home, but um, we, we had some in-depth discussions about our practices when it comes to low price stock trading and, 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 the, and the difficulties that, um, you know, firms like ours and our clients have with knowing what's permissible and what's within the rules. I, I remember specifically asking them the question, you know, if these things are so, you know, so scary to the regulators, why do you permit trading in the way that you do? And, and the answer I got from the SEC was, look, we've got two different, two different arms to the to the SEC. We have the regulatory arm, that's us, you know, the ones that I was talking to that have an interest in, in um, you know, preventing fraud and, and, and things like that. But then they also have the side that is trying to promote small businesses who are the issuers of these things. And so they're kind of competing and talking out of both sides of their mouth makes it a little bit difficult for firms like us to understand what they expect from us, right? But I think, I think it's, good, it's a good opportunity for us to step back and talk a little bit about some of the um, some of the, what they would call red flags, right? Because that's where they left it is, you know, like Bill and Michael said, these are the more and more that these ramp up um, when trading, the more this is on the radar of the regulators. Um, they can't tell us you absolutely can't trade things, but because that's what regulators do, right? They can't, they won't tell you exactly what to do. Just use your best judgment and then we'll come in later and tell you if you messed up. But they, they have, um, sort of outlined a series of red flags for, for firms to look out for. Um, and if you see sort of enough of those red flags, you either don't trade those or you take you know, other steps to report those. So some of those, for example, are red flags around customer activity themselves, right? And that's somewhat easy or relatively easy for us to keep a handle on, right? If, 
the customer puts in an order that's a substantial portion of the ADV, um, you know, that, that might be a red flag as far as, um, you know, uh, fraudulent activity. You know, as Michael, Michael Aguilera pointed out, it, his job becomes a little bit more difficult um, when you see the buildup of trading and then um, all that liquidity subsequently disappears. From my standpoint in compliance, it's that buildup of trading that's troublesome, right? Because now you're worried, is there some promotional activity going or something like that that would point to fraud? Um, other things from a, from, from a client trading standpoint is if there's some pattern of trading low price securities right before the close, um, you know, large deposits. Now we don't, we, don't, we don't take deposits directly, but from a custodial standpoint, if there's large deposits of low price securities, um, if you have multiple clients at the same time trying to deposit um, the same low price security. And then, you know, one thing that they look at too is omnibus accounts, particularly omnibus accounts from the SEC standpoint for um, on behalf of foreign financial institutions. So those things are client activities that, um, you know, for, for, the, for the most part, it are manageable from a compliance standpoint. Where things get a little bit more difficult for us is monitoring the issue itself. Um, there are some things that, that, that aren't difficult, like the price of the stock. You know, it's fairly easy for us to, to see the price of the stock, um, what industry that the issuer is in. Um, one thing that they look for us to look out is, has the issuer changed um, industries to maybe something that's um, a trend right now. Like, uh, for example, they're looking out for cryptocurrency companies or cannabis companies, things like that, I think are particular red flags as far as the SEC is concerned. And then, like we talked about earlier, what market that the, uh, that the stock is traded in. If it's something that's traded on the NYSE, um, it's typically not going to be an issue for the regulators. But some of the other things are a lot more difficult for us to keep a handle on. Um, things like, what is the issuer a shell company or, or are they, have they ever been in the shell company? Um, the SEC has put out publications and FINRA as well that say, okay, what about the uh, management of the issuer? Has the management been involved in other penny stocks? And that's, these are things that are very difficult for, for compliance to sort of manage who is on the board of, his, of an issuer uh, of, of a low price security. Um, has there been any changes to the business model itself recently? Um, is the business verifiable? You know, they, they put on, I've seen some uh, regulatory um, enforcement actions where they expected the, the broker dealer to go out and find out, does, is, there, is there an actual website for the issuer? Um, are they making claims, you know, unsupported claims about projections in the future? And then the big one, of course, is the pump and dump scheme, right? Is there, is there an ongoing promotional effort? And so, you know, for a firm like ours, that's, that's a DVP, we, you know, we're getting orders in the day of, we might not necessarily know that our clients hold these stocks, but then are expected to know, are all these things happening um, are, are the, is the issuer of this underlying low price stock engaging in all these things. So it's certainly on the radar. They certainly expect a lot of things from campus as far as um, you know, supervision goes, but it's an ongoing project for us to keep up with all the expectations. Sure. And I can imagine that that would be uh, difficult. You know, a, a trade comes in for someone like Michael. Um, and then, you know, before we're even able to place that trade, we're having to go back to the client because it's an omnibus account and find out all of that information. So, yeah, I can see how that would be time consuming. And, and quite frankly, from the portfolios or portfolio manager standpoint, you know, it's taking longer to execute that trade um, if it is executable, um, just because we have to find that information in the first place. And, and so there is that trading uh, compliance um, balance, I guess, that you guys are having to do, um, you know, and, and this is important, right? So, uh, there has been enforcement actions that have been taken in the industry. Um, Jason, can you kind of maybe talk a little bit about what some of those enforcement actions are? I mean, it's, it's, a, real, it's a real problem. Sure. Um, you know, there, there's a laundry list that I could pull up. You know, some of the ones that have, that have happened recently that are somewhat significant. Um, you know, Brown Brothers acting in the capacity of custodian a few years back got hit for $8 million. Um, I know that the Oppenheimer got hit for $20 million. Uh, BMP was for another $15 million. These are all fines specifically related to penny stock trading um, and the failure to have an AML process in place to one, recognize the, um, the red flags that I've mentioned previously. Um, and also that these, these trades lend themselves, I think that, I think Steve pointed this out, these, these trades lend themselves often to um, the distribution of unregistered or restricted securities. Right. And so that's something else that causes a lot of you know, enforcement actions related to penny stocks. But there have been tons. You know, I, if you just Google 
um, you know, SEC or FinCEN enforcement actions related to it, and they're all in the millions. And they're all related to, you know, the failure to recognize and report, and that's, the, that's kind of the key, is report the uh, suspicious activity report, these red flags to the Bank Secrecy Department. Great. So we, we've heard from Steve and Bill as far as what um, policies and procedures they've put in place um, to kind of mitigate some of this risk. Um, what has CAPIS put in place from a broker standpoint um, to kind of mitigate this risk for low price stocks? Yeah, we, we've got a few different things at a few different levels that help us out. And, you know, we do we do work with our uh, clearing firm, Bank of America, to, to help us monitor some of this trading. But for the, it's, a, it's on us as a firm. We, as Michael mentioned earlier, we have some stocks that we just won't trade, right? These are, these are ones that we've uploaded into our OMS and in the categories that Michael mentioned earlier, that when they hit our desk, they're automatically rejected. Now our traders see those and, you know, I, I'll often have a conversation with them because, you know, there may be exceptions that we could come up with, but they stop on our desk and no further action can be taken on what we've designated as highly risky or in the categories of highly risky stocks. Past that, though, um, tr our trading desk will report to compliance anytime that we see a substantial portion of the ADV of an order in a low price stock come across our desk. And we have a conversation about it first. So even if it gets through that, that first firewall, um, I still have a conversation with the trader. I will look up some of the red flags that we talked about. Um, there may be an instance where we reach out to the client and have um, additional questions about Rule 144, unregistered or restricted security questions about where the client may have, um, may have obtained the security, how long they've held the security, um, and um, you know, if they intend to sell more in, than the order that they have right now, questions like that. Past that, you know, we do regular reviews on a daily basis of all the, all the penny stocks that come through looking for patterns, check those against some of the red flags that we see as far as um, information about the issuer. And then, you know, on, on a monthly basis, we'll review the same thing. You know, we have had instances, you know, I, I, think, I think it's fair to tell, you know, our clients, and we've been in conversation with our clients that we're not a penny stock trading firm. We um, will make accommodations for clients that have a new client come in and have a portfolio. And we can, we can talk about if it's something that we're able to trade. But as far as constantly getting out of positions, you know, those have been instances where we've had to have car, start some hard conversations with clients. And then um, even instances where we've decided that we weren't a broker for those clients. But for the most part, um, it's just a small portion of our client's business. So we can talk about it and make accommodations on that end. Yeah, I, th I think it sounds like, you know, from at the end of the day, um, you know, we are, as a broker, um, trying to look out for the best interests of our clients. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, even uh, Steve and, and Bill, you know, ultimately, you know, the, the end client, um, you know, has, has some risk there too, right? And so um, I think, uh, you know, trying to look out for, for our end client um, is, is really the, 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 the goal here. So, um, well, guys, hey, I really appreciate um, everybody being on uh, the panel and kind of giving a different perspective um, of, of why, um, you know, there is risk in, in this particular uh, category of, of stocks. And um, I, I know uh, John had um, talked at the very beginning about opening this up for some questions. Um, so if, if anyone does have a question, I'm going to go ahead and turn it kind of over to John um, for, for that uh, Yes, thank you, John. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here. The first one is, reads as follows. With recent reporting around low price stocks, such as Hometown International, the New Jersey Delhi trading with a market cap of over 100 million, do you expect this issue to be something that Gensler's SEC takes more of an interest in? Who wants to, who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> Jason, go ahead. Is this, I'm sorry, this was a question about a particular issue? Uh, yes, they're referring to Hometown International as, a, as a, you know, a low price stock yet with a valuation of over 100 million. It was a deli in New Jersey that somehow- That's the, that's uh, the deli that uh, I think um, does like, I don't know, maybe 15 grand or something like that in, in revenue. And they've got a, a market cap over 100 million. Um, right. Yeah. The, there's certain um, cer certain qualities about an issuer like that, I would assume, would be highly on the radar. Of, um, 
you know, market cap. Um, and, it, and that's well within the market cap of, of, of low priced securities. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's something like that where the, the, the product line and what their, you know, their, their market cap don't necessarily line up, I think would be highly on the radar for, for a low price stock issue. Okay, and a second question we have. Uh, John Lance mentioned with clients finding themselves having to acquire a large shareholder idea, what other novel situations can someone find themselves in when engaging in these type of trades? Anyone want to take that one? I, well, from, from my standpoint, yeah, the large trader ID is a big deal um, just because it kind of catches you off guard. Um, this you know, 20 million shares, um, it might be the first, we have some clients that's the first time, but other situations um, is, is the idea that, you know, we, we have the expectation from our clients. This is what I, concerns me. Um, we have the expectation from a lot of our clients that, you know, we could fill their order, you know, almost immediately. And, um, when, but when it comes to these stocks, we have to stop um, and go back to the client and start asking questions. And they, they may in turn have to go to their client. It really slows down the process for what they're used to. And particularly in an instance where um, we, we ultimately determine it's something we can't trade for them. And then they have to make other accommodations to, to, to figure out how to liquidate that stock. So, you know, I, I always would, would, would stress with our client base to um, get in contact with us early before, if you know that, that you're, you have holdings that might be uh, fit some of these low price profiles or that your clients do, to have those discussions early, long before you intend to actually sell. And then we can make that determination before we're sort of on the clock for it. I was gonna jump in too from, from my standpoint. I think you know one of the things we were worried about and, and I think it's worth thinking about is for people in our position of your end client, right? They're not traders. They don't understand necessarily that they see up there that the last trade that went through is not necessarily the price we can exit or have you help us exit. Um, their entire big position in this. So we always worry we're going to disappoint the client. They're going to think we did something wrong, right? Like uh, obviously we only had one of these, but that was my big worry is that, you know, they saw whatever uh, share price out there and all of a sudden, you know, volume just disappears when you hit the bid, whatever it is. And all of a sudden they go, Oh, I thought I was going to get whatever out of this thing. And now I've got, you know, way less. And now we got a client that's mad at us because we were trying to help them out that's kind of the worst of both worlds. So uh, I think that's another thing too, if you have this situation to maybe have a little discussion around that issue with some of these things that, that the prices are extremely volatile. That was the other reason we were worried is because we're not always, we're not traders. We're not always at our desk. Kind of what Michael talked about, not watching every tick on these things because we're investors, long-term investors. That's not what we do. Um, so again, it, it's not a very good fit for our business model. Sure. All right, I have another question here. How do clearing firms on the brokerage side determine which tickers they will trade and which ones they will not trade? I can speak to our clearing relationship. Um, it's, it's to a degree, it's somewhat arbitrary, right? They have had to, they know that the regulators um, have requirements, but they're not black letter requirements. And it's difficult for, it's just as difficult for the clearing firm as ours for us to decide where that line is of what we can and we can't. I've had numerous discussions with our clearing firm and they've decided, you know, they, they, they sort of drew, drew it based on some designations that OTC Markets makes saying that anything on this these lists, we won't trade. Anything on these lists, we probably can trade, but we might have to have some discussions. But it's, you know, I get the feeling that the Gold Coast, the Gold Coast may move and it's, it's, it's a little bit arbitrary in how they can reach that decision. Yeah, and I remember um, talking with Michael, you know, like he said before, if, uh, if you're on the OTC uh, markets website and you see that skull and crossbones, it's an absolutely not going to be able to trade that name. Um, and, and then I know, you know, ultimately there, there are some other things that might show up um, as a maybe we can trade that name, maybe we can't. Um, so it, it sounds like like what you were saying, Jason, is it's somewhat arbitrary. Um, it doesn't sound like there's a hard and fast line uh, to a degree. I mean, there is with, with some things, but, um, but not with others, it's kind of more um, 
kind of gray to a degree, which is kind of unfortunate. And, you know, talking with you earlier as well, it sounds like the regulators haven't really necessarily come out with a hard and fast rule as well. Like, you know, for instance, if a stock is under a certain price period, it will not trade. Um, so it makes it a little bit more difficult um, for really everyone involved. It, it makes it more difficult for um, for the bank trust department. It makes it a little more difficult for the, the custodian. Um, and it makes it more difficult from, from our brokerage standpoint as well. Am, am I speaking correctly when I say that, Jason? You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and, and like, it, like I mentioned earlier, it's, um, it's, it's one of those things that they, they sort of give us this very loose collection of, of, of red flags to look out for. And, um, you know, they'll, they'll let us know if we slip up and make a mistake, I'm sure. Yeah. Hey, John, I, I, I would add and I would, I would echo that, you know, to all the clients out there, as you're hearing this discussion, you can kind of tell it's a, it's a partnership with all of your providers. So I may be talking to Capus, I may be talking to an investment advisor. We all have different inputs that we're getting from the financial community about what's really a moving target. Uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier in our case, BTC does a wide uh, spectrum of, of these transactions that they see across the industry. So they help us out tremendously in helping to identify items. So, you know, lean on your custodian, your broker, your advisor to get advice if, if you have a chance before these things hit. And we have another question here from the floor. Do any of you see this trend in institutions dealing with low price stock trading as connected to retail participation in the markets in any way? I'm happy to jump in. I, I, uh, sorry, I have no problem jumping in. I, um, I think it can be. I think the increase in interest from from the regulators, and then you know, the, the more that we see, um, you know, as Bill had mentioned earlier, some of these stocks that clients have held for years that had seen no activity, now you know they're they're, they're going from you know fifty mils up to a penny or something like that. Um, all of these things add to activity and are going to get the regulators' attention. But um, this, the, the, the guidance from the regulators has been coming out for several years now. And a lot of the cases that I mentioned have been, um, have taken place activity going back at least, you know, five to 10 years. And so I think this has been on their radar for a while, but certainly the, the, the uptick in um, retail interest in these penny stocks is only going to make it uh, more of a focus for the SEC. And even from, Oh, go ahead, Bill. No, I mean, I was just going to say, I mean, obviously I don't have any, uh, I, you know, necessarily data to back this up, but I think we can all say, well, you know, you've got zero interest rates, you've got these apps that have come out. I'm not throwing them under the bus. I just think it's exposed more people to this. And so, you know, it's, they see it as an opportunity to, you know, I'll be honest, it's a bit of a gambling thing. And so, you know, and they see stuff on Reddit and some of those, you know, the online. And I think that stuff just, just now permeated through. So I think, they play around in some of these names that are uh, are these low priced names, and so uh, I don't know when that goes away. I, I think well, maybe when the bull market ends and and things like that. But I think it's kind of part of every cycle to some extent, right? We we see some you know zombies come back alive again and then <laughs> die again in the uh, in the bear market. So not I'm not rooting for bear market by the way on this call, but uh, I think it is part of the the, the backdrop. Yeah, and I, I mean, I can I can even speak to that a little bit to that question, in, in that I've I've had some clients um, just have an increase in activity just because you know their end client, their 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 beneficiary of a trust, um, you know that that may be a discretionary trust um, has a little bit more time on their hands. They've been you know dabbling in the market themselves, and so you know they they see a name that that they have in their own portfolio, and they maybe want to have that in the trust as well, and so you know they're directing their um, their bank trust department to, to purchase something like that. So I think at least there are those conversations um, because of uh, the increase in, um, in retail trading. Um, okay, we have one last question here from the floor. 
Does Capus offer a list of currently approved trading penny stock tickers and the total volume available to trade minimum and maximum requirements? No, um, we, we, we don't have a list because the list changes frequently. Um, you know, if, if we have a client that has their own list, you know, I'd be or particular names, I'd be happy to um, to take a look at that. Unfortunately, it's it's you know, it's, it's this totality of the circumstances a lot with these trades and we have to individually um, analyze whether something's problematic based on all those factors that we looked at. You know, there are those categories that we mentioned earlier that are sort of, um, rejected from the start. And those are, um, you know, that, that, that website, it's a public website to go to OTC markets, type in the ticker and see if some of those categories come up. Um, but since that can even change on a daily basis, because um, we get an upload for, from OTC markets every morning and we can put that into our OMS. So it's a little bit difficult for us to publish a list of clients um, that, that, is, that is current that we can sort of guarantee would, in, um, would, would allow certain trades that are in the future. Yeah, and, and you know, what, what Mike had said earlier too is that, that, that lot, and what you just said, that list changes um, constantly. You know, something that we might be able to trade today uh, we don't have the ability to trade tomorrow. Um, so it, it, it's constantly changing. And so uh, we don't want to provide a list, you know, that's a, a hard and fast list for, for someone to go off of um, knowing that that, you know, can change, um, you know, daily. Um, so. That's it for all our questions, John. All right, great. Well, again, I want to thank um, Steve and Bill, Jason, Mike. Um, I appreciate y'all being on the call today. Um, you know, we're going to go ahead and have a, uh, a recording of this um, sent out uh, afterwards. And, um, you know, if you guys do have questions, if, if anybody has a question that's listening in today, um, feel free to reach out to your, your CAPAS rep um, as well. And, and, you know, if we don't have the answers off the top of our head, we'll go ahead and find those out for you. Uh, we'll contact Steve or, or even get Bill's opinion as well. Um, so again, thank you all for being on the call today. Uh, we really appreciate it and um, happy trading. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for being a part of this call. Again, if you have any questions or comments, we invite you to reach out to your CAPAS representative or sales coverage expert. And also, we'd like everyone to be on the lookout for upcoming CAPAS roundtables on transition management and fixed income, as well as our May 20th research call featuring Katie Stockton of Fairlead Strategies. Again, thank you so much, everyone, and have a great trading day.